Hello, and welcome to the Mr. 50mm YouTube channel. I'm going to discuss reasons why the Panasonic GF3 is such a joy to use for DIY projects. Specifically, I'm going to be referring to my digital rangefinder that I built, uh, but I'll also refer to the digital TLR that I did as well. So far, you may have guessed, I have converted three GF3s into different projects. Two rangefinders, one into a digital TLR, and I have killed two GF3s. May they rest in pieces. This video aims to answer the question that nobody asked, but that I want to answer. Now, I must warn you, I'm going to talk about uh, the GF3 in detail, and I'm going to talk about some very seemingly pedantic stuff. So if this isn't your cup of tea and you want, you want my regular amount of pedanticness, might I suggest clicking away to a regular camera review or any one of my other apparently over 100 videos at this point. For everyone else who is curious to see as to why I keep butchering GF3s, let's dive in. The things I hated about the GF3 make it a joy to DIY. The GF3 lacks a lot of things. When it comes to ergonomics, you know, that's where the camera falls down a bit. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that this camera has no mode dial. The camera on the back only has one of these multi-way dial controller thingies, so there's no dedicated command dials. The back also only has two buttons there. And if you look at the top plate for more controls, you will only find a IA mode select or toggle button, shutter button, the video record button, and a power toggle. Now, back to the rear screen. At the least, one saving grace is that this LCD is a touch panel. That being said, it is a single touch only screen, which even for taking account the camera's age, felt old. So, in essence, the GF3, it is, you know, it's a small camera. What that kind of means is that they ended up omitting a lot of things in order to keep on top of the limited working volume of the GF3. This, I think, overall resulted in fewer, smaller, more integrated parts. This kind of also resulted in kind of allowing me to have a little bit of freedom when it comes to maneuvering those parts into a new body, since there were kind of few of them, there wasn't that much stuff to like have to worry about placing and re remounting. So you could kind of easily move them into something like this. As I mentioned, the GF3 omitted a mode dial. So how do you change modes then? Well, it's done via either the menu or directly on the touchscreen. It's not as quick as a mode dial, and it's not as good as a mode dial, but on my rangefinder build, it actually meant that I didn't have to worry about figuring out where to place a mode dial, and without a mode dial, it actually makes the camera look a little more rangefinder-esque, since you don't normally see mode dials on rangefinders. Overall, why is less control a good thing? As it turns out, again, on the GF3, since there are not a lot of buttons, not a lot of command dials, well, no real command dial, and just few things to interface with, it generally means that there's just also less things I need to port over in a DIY build. And while the GF3 doesn't have that many controls, there are enough. It does, you know, clearly function as a camera. And because of 
the way that the controls are pretty minimal, you actually don't need to omit any controls that the GF3 had on a DIY build since there weren't that many to begin with. And I think that makes it another thing that I did think that I might actually, you know, miss having were real command dials. But then I remembered for my rangefinder build, uh, rangefinders don't have command dials anyways. So again, one less thing I needed to worry about porting over. It saves effort. And again, I think not having the dial on the camera gives it a little bit more of that rangefinder-esque look. Random nice things with the GF3 that make it nice to work with on a DIY project. Well, let's start with something small. For starters, there is one part on the camera that is connected to uh, the main board using a flat flex cable, but that part actually contains a bunch of small things. It contains things like the microphone that you could see in this top plate. It contains, oh, maybe, maybe not. Let's see, please focus. There we go. The microphone there, there is also the, there's a speaker there as well. That is the speaker grill. There's a little LED thing. And it also happens to contain the clock battery. And it's actually kind of a, I think, pretty good implementation of the flat flex, because it basically is a flat flex cable that branches out into different functions. And I found it pretty nice because depending on what I wanted to include on my build, I could literally take a pair of scissors and cut the part up. And so I ended up omitting the speaker that's built into the camera and one of the LEDs, uh, specifically this one here. So, you know, I cut those out and, you know, reconnect the flat flex, camera doesn't care. It goes on and functions as you would expect. One nice thing about not having these extra parts is I didn't have to worry about finding a space to put them in my build because I just removed it. Another nice thing was that that rear LCD and rear button panel. That's this whole thing over here. But I will hold up the actual assembly here. This is the button assembly. And here is the LCD. This is a bit messy. It's hard to see, but this is it. The nice thing about these, you might've noticed, is that the flat flex cable is ridiculously long on the LCD and it's pretty long on this button panel. There's quite a bit of play you have there when you're trying to figure out where you wanna put these. And that's quite nice. Now, I'm actually not sure why the flat flexes for these two parts are that long, but I'll be grateful that they are because it actually makes maneuvering the LCD and the rear button panel into place very easy. I'm not worried about uh, the fact that, you know, the cable might be too short or I need it might need to, you know, sneak or snake in a pair of tweezers underneath the main board and the LCD to get everything fit together. There's ample space due to how long those flat flexes are on the main board that I could easily get those parts installed. So remember when I was talking about the fact that this camera is a pretty highly integrated camera with you know, minimal assemblies and things? Well, it is something that is a bit glorious. The entire camera breaks out into a couple pieces. You got three main PCBs with you know the main board being one of them. You have an LCD assembly, a rear button assembly, then you have your sensors, your shutter, and your lens mount, plus some other small parts. And another nice thing about them is that these all directly connect onto the, you know, the back side of the main board if you're facing the, hmm, how do I put this? If the front is oriented to the front of the camera, it is the, side looking at the screen where all these connectors are and they're all on that one side which is very nice 
another thing that is very nice about this camera is that for the most part, the connectors for the flat flexes are like zero insertion force or ZIF connectors. You pop a latch, you can easily pull the connector out. And then when you got to put it back in, put it in, no force required, close the latch. It's very nice. I'm um, looking at some other cameras there, like the Sony Nex 3, which in doing some research for some reason, decide that they will have different types of connectors for their flat flex cables, not just ZIF connectors. Why? All right, that's all I got for this video. Let me know if you guys actually like this kind of video where I dive into some more specific detail about my DIY builds and, you know, basically some of the thought processes and things that I think about when I'm doing my builds. Uh, I have no idea how these kind of things will turn out, but you know, if you like them, I'll probably keep making them. But if not, probably can save everyone a little bit of time and explain less my thoughts and more show the results. You know, it's not 100% mandatory that I dump all my brain thinky bits onto YouTube. Uh, but again, if it is something that you do find interesting, uh, then leave a comment down below. Otherwise, as always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Maybe a super thanks if you're into that. Otherwise, till next time, bye.